Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tech Talks with Tomer. I'm Tomer, VP of Product at Stellar Development Foundation, and today we're in Madrid for Meridian, the annual Stellar Con. With me is Muli Sagib, CEO at Sectora. Hey Muli, how's it going? Fine, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm really happy to have you here with us. So um, I was looking through my emails and I saw that the first time we ever connected was in May 2019. It was a while back. Um, and back then you were still doing market research around smart contracts uh, and uh, in this industry. And you've gone a long way since, which is amazing. Uh, but before we dive into Sartora, I'd love to learn a bit more about your personal journey. How did you end up in formal verification? Okay, that's a great uh, challenge and it's for a long time. So what happened, I started at the Technion and uh, I got actually fascinated in formal verification when I was still a graduate student. Unfortunately, I didn't have anybody who knows formal verification. But my advisor at the time was a fantastic guy. He told me, look, you are right, you're going to learn on your own and I'm going to help you. And that's what we did. We actually had people bringing from abroad. So Reinhard Willem came to visit me, a lot of people. And I actually built this field in Israel. We later on, I found out that Amir Pnueli was a Turing Award winner. Actually did a lot of work before me, but I didn't even know about him. And we actually got to know each other after a long time ago. And we said, how come we? And we basically, I mean, he's, he, he actually founded the field. He founded a, a, a lot of things, temporal logic. But I actually ended up doing many, many of the works at this place. And actually, it was very interesting. I had sort of a weird career where I started, went to industry, and then I came back to academia. But I, I, I felt more and more interested in this space. So the interesting thing about formal verification is it, it feels like this used to be a very strong academic field, maybe even niche. And then, you know, the previous, in, in the last few years, this seems to have exploded. Did you see this coming? Not really, not really. I, I came in a bad time. I came in a bad time. I was, I was working in Israel, but for example, at least the, the funding agency in the US, when you would say you are doing formal verification, this is a case not to get the fund. But what happened is about, uh, I guess, about eight years ago or nine years ago, it changes. And all of a sudden you're saying formal verification and you immediately fund it. So the, 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 the atmosphere really changes. It went down, up, down, and then up again. Yeah. And how much of this is blockchain related? It's blockchain. actually before blockchain. Blockchain is a big push, but it's before blockchain. I think distributed system is a big push for that. The fact that people found big things in the distributed system. And the fact that it just became, the techniques became more mature. People became more mature. Systems like Koch actually make formal verification. The fact that people are able to prove C compilers and then people are trying to find bugs in them. The Salesforce project in Australia that showed that you can build correct operating system that people have tried. So people actually have, have done in academia a lot of projects which were almost industrial. So there is the, the INRIA in France, so there's a lot of Microsoft research. They've built a lot of actually interesting stuff that influences this space. And then of course came the blockchain, but even prior to blockchain, people have done a lot of interesting small projects which are very influential in this space. Now you're saying that blockchain gave it a, a big push. Why is that? Like, what is it about smart contracts uh, that, uh, you know, drives so well with the uh, formal verification? Smart contract is probably the, the best uh, application for smart for formal verification because you have small code, it's almost immutable. It's almost like your hardware in some sense. But unlike hardware, it changes it quickly. So all of these things you are basically, this is, this is changing your, the way you are doing. So you need this thing. It's also the fact that so much money at stake. And also if you have a bug, it's so hard to fix it. Whether your contract is immutable or mutable, it's so hard to fix it and whether you have to be a vote. So it's really, really hard. Right. And I imagine it also helped the smart contracts are kind of like small pieces of software exactly. and they're also sandboxed in, in their environment, right? Exactly. They're small, they're sandboxed. And it also it does also help that the people who are working with are fairly technical. So they are, they are actually able to to actually work on, on these things. And do you feel like, uh, how, how is the journey of like teaching engineers, software engineers, to be more formal verification minded? Do like, you find that easy, challenging? How's that journey going for you? I find it challenging, but I find it actually uh, unsurprisingly well. 
I find that actually when we teach now to, to, to Solidity developers, we see that some of them are so bright, we get them to see environments that we haven't seen even by academics. So we are seeing them thinking about properties. The, 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 you see that, for example, people have tried to use formal application in hardware, and they were companies, but engineers, especially, I think they didn't want to touch the, the formal specification. They say, okay, I'm going to pay you and you do the formal specification. But here you can see engineers who are contributing formal specification, which is amazing. So you, you believe that every software engineer has the potential to write their own spec, basically. Exactly, exactly. And I think it's the best that they write the spec. And sometimes it's better that they write the spec before they write the code. Often they, we find we go to customer and we tell them, we, we work for them. We do this audit and then we say, here is the property and it's violated. It's just, oh, why didn't you tell us about this property before we wrote the code? Yeah. <laughs> if we only knew this property, the code would look much different. So yeah, so writing the spec as early as you can is the, is the is, is interesting thing. Of course, not always you can, but when you can, think about your spec. Think about what you want your code to satisfy and how is it interact with the other contract Think about, about that and think about the tech surface as early as you can before even you can write the code. Okay, so let's let's dive a bit deeper into Sertora. Obviously, uh, the world has changed since this, uh, this, that initial email in, in May 2019. Um, can you tell us a bit about what's unique uh, about Sertora in this world of formal verification and smart contracts um, and how you have became so popular in some of the biggest projects out there using emails? Yes, yes. So I think it's a mixture of people, technology, uh, professional service, all, all kinds of things, connection. Of course, we probably should acknowledge VCs that were basically telling people use Sertora. So, so the, a lot of things happened. At the beginning, we had this tool. It was not really working. It was sort of compiling the, the code into a, a formula, but it was sort of a very simple technique. And we tried it. We actually worked with Compound, which was one of the first team we worked. And we worked after they completed the best audit. And the tool found a bug. And it found a critical error. And, and they tell us, oh, how we get this tool work on all your code? We said, we have no idea. <laughs> so they uh, we said, so get it to work. We said, look, you guys are not paying us. That's what we can do. So, they, so we basically didn't help them. Of course, they, we found this one bug. And then they launched the code and found somebody else found a huge error in the code that we didn't break. So they asked us how you get this work on all the code. And that's what's tricky for us. We ended up developing a lot of techniques. In particular, I want to point it out, John Thorman, who joined us, is uh, our VP research from the from, uh, University of Washington. So he did very clever static analysis, which basically recovers the memory. It's basically fixing up all the problems with the EVM on the, on the thing. So we basically ended up generating much simpler formulas so the SMT can, can deal with these formulas, and we're still doing it. It's, it's basically, we are trying to use the, this, this, these SMTs as in, in the easiest possible way. And that's what we did. And also, on top of it, we became more, we understand more and more of the domain. And there is a network effect. The customer that we work, they are building things which are similar, essentially. So we work with Compound, we did a good job. But then it helps us in the, in the job with Alva, because Alva is building something which is different than Compound, but it has a lot of similarities. And then we work with, with the Compound team. And of course, there were teams like the Maker team that they use actually to use other formal verification, and they swapped working with us, and they actually started writing their own spec, which is interesting. So they ended up writing, and that's actually much more scalable process for us, because we just license our software. And so all of these customers, they derive the tool and actually the beginning, it used to be the case when there is a failure, you would have to call our co-founder Shelly and say what's wrong. And now we have a better UI. We are building a better UI because you want to actually show failures. Muli, I want to zoom in on one thing that you said around the EVM. You mentioned that you had to learn uh, you know, a lot of the issues around building for the EVM. And I'm curious how much of the issues and bugs that you see relate to the EVM specifically versus kind of like, you know, more general code issues? That's a great question. Uh, I'm probably not the person to answer it. I think the technical people on the team, we have a team with uh, 45 amazing, amazing engineers. So my guess is that it's mixed. There are some things which are uh, specific to the EVM, or also not only to the EVM, to the way the Solidity compiler generates the EVM code, which makes things very hard for 
many things. Uh, the way memory is handled is, is crazy, that it's basically, but some of it is actually something that I imagine uh, you have in Sora, but for example, I'm, are you using bumper locator? I don't know, are you, this how you, how you are using, you are, yes, so you're gonna need us to, so we, we have methods to deal with bumper location that people, we, I didn't know when I, in academia, I didn't know this is such a big, big issue. But it's a big issue, bumper locator, and reason about bumper locator. Got it. So we need to know something like aliasing between variables. And that's actually something that we developed. But I told you that this is something that we said that John did, which made the tool actually working, is reading about bumper location. So some of the things that we did, we say it's EVM, but it's actually not EVM. Yeah. It's the way the compiler uses the EVM. Yeah. So we actually, like, we, uh, there is an allocator available, although Soroban really uh, puts an emphasis on like hosted types. So for the most part, contract developers don't actually need uh, to touch the allocator itself. But that's super interesting. I imagine the things like re-entrancy attacks and just like dealing with like, you know, uh, uh, you know, the math mathematical semantics of UN 256s is probably also a lot of the issues that you see. Exactly. So, so nonlinear um, arithmetic is helping us from day one. It's still helping us. It's still helping us. We have a lot of techniques and we are developing new techniques, but each time you have even a new AMM, it's hard for us to reason about. So these are, so yes, these, there are fundamental issues which are almost language independent that you get to see. Got it. Um, so, you know, you mentioned Soroban, uh, and we just announced in Meridian that we're collaborating on bringing Soroban support to uh, the Sertora service, which is super exciting. Um, and if I understand correctly, this is the first WebAssembly uh, language that will be, uh, or the first WebAssembly runtime that will be supported in your stack, right? I think it's it's two things. It's the first WebAssembly, and we'll also have the first sort of support for, at the moment when we have, for example, in Solana, when we write specs, we write it in Rust. But I think here we want to develop our own language like CVL for writing the spec. Right. So we want to decouple the specification from the code, because specification sometimes is harder than the code. So we want to be able to reuse specification between different protocols and between different versions of the code and integrate it into CI. So Got that's it. what we want to do. And I'm curious, what do you think are some of the you know, challenges? What's, uh, you know, like, what's the opportunity with working in WebAssembly and Rust versus uh, you know, the current EVM stack? I think for us, it's a great idea because it opens us to the world of, of WebAssembly and Rust. It makes us, in some sense, a company that's not just addressing solidity. It's making us like a, a much larger potential uh, uh, teams that are working on, on Rust and using this technology to secure their code. And it's also uh, help us sort of integrate more tightly with the compiler because maybe there are things that the Rust compiler can tell us about ownership and things like that that would make our Alice analysis easier to, to handle. So we can actually, or we can propagate information from the compiler to the WebAssembly and then from the WebAssembly to us, to our internal representation, so we can reason about it. Awesome, yeah, and we're super excited to have this. I think we saw Brian talk about fuzzing yesterday and we're building up a toolbox for testing and uh, Sertora sounds like a, a really great addition to that stack. Correct, and we, I think I told you, we will use Brian's tool initially. We want to actually try to understand these are very related things. Maybe one thing that we can happen with our CDL, with our language, maybe we can integrate this fuzzing because we did want to have, we do want to have fuzzing, sort of first for the cases that this nonlinear mass is too hard. Maybe people have something that they can try and maybe they can even do something like they can try some values and run the tool. So we are super excited about the fuzzing project and the fact that you integrated the fuzzing project and the fact that it even can, you, you told me that it can even run uh, not on the blockchain. That's very interesting and it's potential for us in our own audits and, and to use the, these kind of technology. And, uh, you know, just for the audience listening, can you give us like a brief primer on how formal verification is different from, was, uh, from fuzzing or like what additional benefits do you get? Yeah, yeah, so I think Brian's talk was amazing. He had this slide with three points, what fuzzing gives, and he just said at the end, no proof. So essentially, this is one line of sort of explaining. The idea yeah. is that it's much more exhausting. And also another advantage of formal verification, I don't know if it's an advantage, maybe it's a feature. Usually when you test your code, you think of starting from initial state, which makes perfect sense. 
We do not start from initial state. We start from an arbitrary state which satisfies your environment. This state may or may not be reachable. So the bug that we are finding may not be a real one if you didn't write the right in environment. Right. So we are basically, it's a much more exhaustive tool, but it requires more work from the, from the programmer, sort of thinking about the environment which, which holds, and it also requires, in our case, because we are doing it automatic, more computational resource that at the moment in Satora, it's hosted on the cloud. Right, got it. Okay, we're uh, starting to run out of time. Uh, maybe as a last question, can you tell us a bit, you know, obviously Soroban is coming to Satora, which is the most exciting thing happening in Satora, but can you tell us about anything uh, else that you can share about uh, what the future holds for Satora? Uh, well, actually Satora is, uh, some people think about Satora as a formal verification company. That's not the way I view Satora. I view it more as a security company. And we are doing a lot of things as a security company, unfortunately. Many of them I couldn't reveal, but one thing that we are doing with uh, some clients, we are helping them with incident response. One of the most interesting things that happen in this domain are, are white hackers. And white hackers are, we are helping our clients, but we are also developing technology. So we want to be basically a tool, and actually we are doing this now, uh, to, today actually with Ave, and actually next week with Code Arena. So we are, we are launching competition for people to use the tool, and we will do it also with Soroban. So for us, it's it's very exciting because we can see when we have a competition, the cloud usage bumps up because many, many more people using our tool. And we think that actually community is the way to go. We are also doing verification heroes. We are looking for people and we are finding people in the community who are using the tool better than us. We love it. Awesome, yeah, we, we're, uh, we can't wait to join in on that action. So Muli, thank you so much for joining. Uh, and thank you all for listening and stay safe, maybe with Satora. <laughs>